Welcome to another episode of 72 Minute Connector. With us today we have Tom Webster. Oh! Adam Jordan. Hello! And myself, Eric Fine. How are y'all doing tonight? Pretty Not good. Sitting here with a delicious uh, mug of tea. Talking with my friends about things I love. <sighs> Lucky bastard. All I have is water <laughs> because I'm out of beer. <laughs> Uh, I also have water. No reason? Just because you wanted water? Well, I, I had coffee, and I didn't really want to take the time to make another pot of coffee, so Hold on. I have That's water. Fair. Hold on. That's it's fair. 10 o'clock at night for you, right? Yeah. Yes. Coffee? Hey, coffee, coffee is like a hey. 24-hour deal, okay? Coffee is not, it's not a breakfast item. Coffee is a lifestyle. Coffee is a lifestyle. Actually, there's something enjoyable about like a really late night coffee. Oh yeah, as long as you don't have anything to do in the morning. <laughs> I mean, I'm hit and miss. Most of the time, caffeine doesn't do much for me. But I mean, there is some times where it's just like two o'clock in the morning. I open up my eyes and I'm like, "Fuck me." <laughs> yeah. Tom will open up his eyes at two o'clock in the morning and say, "Well, I might as well start my day since I wake up in an hour anyway." <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, the other day I woke up. At 2.40, 20 minutes before my alarm goes off, I'm like, ah, oh, I'll go back to bed. I woke up at 4. It's like, ah, oh, damn it. All right. I was going to play around a Dota this morning. I guess I'm not. Those are always the worst. I'll wake up about 20 minutes, 30 minutes before my alarm goes off, and I'll feel good. But I'll talk myself back into, you know what? Close those eyes. Be that lazy son of a bitch that you always hate in the morning. <laughs> and whenever that alarm goes off, I feel like complete ass. Every yep. time. And if you just got out of bed, you would have felt totally awake and perfectly fine. I fucking yeah. sleep cycles. Listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> so other than sleep, you guys been doing uh, much else? A little bit of gaming, actually. I got some gaming in this week. Cool. What have you played? Uh, I have been going through, uh, again, The Walking Dead Season 1, which I'm not going to say anything about. Uh, Because for those listeners out there that are still listening to the podcast, Godspeed. Um, (laughs) And uh, we will be having a Walking Dead spoiler cast. We will give you plenty of ample warning before we get heavy into the spoilers. Uh, But that will be coming next week. So we're going to finish playing through that and uh, get you guys some good in-depth discussion on that game. Uh, In person. With with the witness. Yes, in person. It will be an in-person live 72-pin connector. So next week. This channel, uh, I think this time, right? Yes, same time. Yeah, might as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, tune in because we, we're going to do horrible, awful things. You, you don't mind, like, having your place be home to, like, lots of drugs, strippers, hookers. Oh, no. No, that's a, okay. that's a, that's a usual Friday evening. Okay, good. Good. So just, just have about three times the normal amount, yeah. and then I'll be ready. You guys get your own goods, and we'll be okay. All right. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. Good. I'm prepped. My car has plenty of trunk space. <laughs> We're many, gonna need it. The important question is how many rugs? <laughs> We're gonna need some rugs. Enough. Yeah. So, aside from that, um, I did finish up Doom. Um, and I have to say, from the very start of the game to the very end of the game, it is everything I wanted from a, an actual Doom game. It was fast, it was violent, it was metal as fuck. It had a glorious, amazing soundtrack, and it didn't apologize for anything. Um, I mean, from, you know, getting sent back and forth to hell several times and literally tearing demons in half with your bare hands. Just everything cheesy and gory and amazing about Doom was just packaged into this game perfectly. The campaign is about... I, I finished it in about 11 hours. So it's not a very long game, but I will be playing through the campaign multiple times. I feel entirely justified in my purchase. So I'm That's awesome. going to ask, you like the campaign. So do you know what happened? Or did uh, you just you... kill stuff? Oh, oh, yes, there is a story. There is a story. Um, not like, you know, a super in-depth story. You're not like getting Walking Dead levels of story, which we'll get into <laughs> next week. That's a teaser for you at home. Um, <laughs> see, I'm really good at this now. I'm, I'm getting to it. Uh, but there is a story. Um, it does connect to the previous games 
uh, but it's nothing in depth. Uh, basically, you can sum up the story of Doom, of all Doom games, as you are Doom guy and you exist solely to kill demons, and that's it. And you may or may not go to hell. That's the game. That's the whole story of the game, but it's got a lot of polish, a lot of like uh, cheesy, super gory B horror movie stuff to it. Not like jump scares, but you know, like tearing stuff limb from limb and then beating demons to death with their own arms. Which is hilarious. <laughs> Every time it happens, I just crack up. Um, you know, to to this awesome rock and metal soundtrack. Uh, so if if you can, uh, especially if it's on sale, I feel entirely justified in a thirty dollars purchase. Uh, even sixty, I don't think I would have been mad at what I got. Uh, it's everything I wanted out of a Doom game. So what's blown my mind about this game is it's incredibly high rated. Everyone loved it all over the place for its campaign. Mm-hmm. came out this year but if you're patient you'll find it for 25 bucks this game oh, yeah. got marked down so quick for being a new release and yeah that's, that's just- surprising i don't know why I, I wonder i wonder if it was you know people like me because i bought doom 3 on launch mm-hmm. and doom 3 was I I really struggle because I I instantly go to calling Doom Three a terrible game, and it's not a terrible game. It's it's actually a pretty good game, but it's not a good Doom game. It's a horrible yeah. Doom game. It's the worst Doom game because it just there's nothing fast about it. It's slow. It's plotting. It's locked to mm-hmm. corridors, and it's filled with jump scares. That's not Doom. Yeah. Um, and and there's nothing there's nothing awesome or like totally metal about it either. Um. So I, I think I think after playing Doom Three and going through all that and paying full price on launch day, I, for myself, I was really apprehensive about this new game. I was like, eh, I don't know. Doom Three was enough of a disappointment, and Rage was such a steaming pile that I'm just going to stay away for right now until I get a good price and read a whole bunch of reviews, which they're out there now. Um, and yeah. if you want some more information on. Uh, you know, the the making of Doom and how they came back from Doom 3, which, by the way, uh, Doom 4, the first version, is so much worse than Doom 3 ever could be. It was basically Call of Doom, is what people internally refer to. <laughs> it was really bad. It was like squad-based. Yeah. It was all just absolutely terrible. Everything they tried to modernize it too much? It was awful. And they go really in depth into this wonderful documentary by No Clip. Uh, it's called Doom Resurrection. It's three parts, it's on YouTube for free, so go out and check that out. Uh, it's about an hour and a half for the whole thing. Um, and it goes into uh, what they were trying to build, how they threw it all away, how they started over, and how it ended up being so good. Uh, the guy who did the soundtrack actually was talking. He said, Yeah, on launch night, uh, after everything went live at midnight, I sat and I watched some Twitch streamers because, you know, when you're making music, you don't know if it's good because you have a really compromised sense of judgment. I thought it was good. I didn't know if anyone else would think that. He said he watched his Twitch streamer and he, he got into a fight and he said his head started bobbing a little bit. He's like, yes, I got him. <laughs> it is good. <laughs> So there's That's there's awesome. little things like that. So yeah. uh, Doom Resurrected, uh, check that out on YouTube. Again, it's by No Clip. Uh, there's a three part series about an hour and a half, and it is totally worth the watch if you like behind the scenes gaming stuff. Um, I did check out the multiplayer a little bit. I don't know. I haven't. I, I gave it you know a good 15 minutes, so I can't really speak authoritatively about it. But I wasn't mm. the biggest fan of what I saw. It felt like a slower unreal tournament to me well their multiplayer is what caused the entire bethesda reviewing i don't want to say scandal but issue come up because they gave out early access to reviewers for that multiplayer and it got shit on so they never actually gave the single player campaign for reviewers to take a look at i i could see that happening i mean the the multiplayer getting shit on because it's from what i've played i played 15 minutes i played one single deathmatch map um it just it felt a little slow, a little clunky to me. I they they mix Doom with like the Call of Duty XP system, which I don't think really meshes too well. Uh, and if I remember correctly, the multiplayer was made by an entirely different studio than the campaign. They just mashed oh, really? it together afterwards. Yeah, oh. so it does feel different. Yeah, that makes a big difference. 
Yeah. So I, I think if they all kept it all in house, it would have been mm-hmm. better. That said, the campaign might have suffered. So I'll take what I got. I got a great Doom game. Well, yeah. It's also kind of refreshing and uh, change from the norm. I mean, when you look at shooters nowadays, I mean, there's only one I know that's built on a story. And even then, people go to the multiplayer. It's always multiplayer yeah. first with first person shooters. It's how it's been for the last decade. You and see, I here think you have one where the story is really the only selling point. I think id Software is really turning that on its head, at least with their first per- or their first party IP with the stuff they own, uh, because Doom is very focused on the campaign. In Wolfenstein, uh, the New Order, when it came out, there was no multiplayer. To this day, there's no multiplayer. It's a single player campaign only game, uh, and I think we're starting to see the rebirth of old id Software, which is. It just makes me so happy on the inside. We've got <laughs> a great Wolfenstein game. We have a great Doom game. The only thing ne- left is a great Quake game. Yeah. Maybe maybe they could throw in a great Commander Keen game, but I think that time has come and gone. <laughs> I was so didn't, on- Oh, sorry, Adam. Oh, um, didn't they also add like a, a campaign creator map editor thing for Doom? Yes, thank you, because I totally forgot about that. Snap Maps. <laughs> yeah. uh, this, is, this is my new favorite thing, and I have been playing uh, a bit of this. So uh, the community can now uh, make their own maps with a really nice map editor. Um, and it's, it's easy enough for everyone to use. Uh, it's not you know, as powerful as jumping into like Unreal Editor or something where you know, you're using game development tools to make your own levels, but it's easy enough that you can throw this on a console and expect people to get it. Uh, so there's a lot of cool scripting, custom game modes. Uh, you can make everything from you know, single-player maps to co-op maps, puzzle maps, survival maps, really anything you wanted to do in Snap Map, you can do. Uh, so in, they've got every week, they refresh this list of, hey, here's the stuff we think is really rad go play this. Um, And then you get points and unlock stuff in that mode. It's really awesome. And most of the snap maps you can play in a lobby. So you can play with other people multiplayer. It really brings back the feeling of old Doom hooked up over a LAN. Nice. I never played Doom with anyone but myself. Really? Oh, it was great. I was back on my uh, Windows 95 machine with my demo disc putting it in with 101 demo games on it and only going oh, to Doom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, wait, hold on. You never played Doom on the Xbox 360 at Wright State. Okay, so I... <laughs> I dabbled a little bit, but my Doom experience came from an old-ass computer in my parents' bedroom on the only computer we had in the house, shooting big red globs with scary faces coming at you. And like little brown <laughs> monsters with rocket launchers looks like attached to their arms. Yeah, I think you just described literally every Doom game except for Doom 3. And my sensibilities as a kid, even at that point, was what the fuck is going on? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I urge all the listeners to go check out Doom Resurrected, uh, the Doom documentary on YouTube. Uh, they, they go into some really cool stuff. And at, at one point, um, the creators are like, well, you know, we we don't have a story and they, they wouldn't give a date, but they said, yeah, we were like dangerously close to releasing this game and we had nothing tying it all together. Uh, so they said, well, it, it's doom. It should be self-aware. We know you're fighting demons. We don't have to have a reason for demons. It's just, you know, hell demons, evil corporation. Yeah. Blow them up. And they made the game pretty campy and pretty cheesy. And it, it ended up being like, you know, everything that was good about doom. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, that's that's about for that. Uh, and then Dota, which we'll get into later. Have you played a lot of it? Uh, I've put in a couple hours into Dota since the new patch, and I've mm-hmm. got mixed feelings. Yeah. I've only dabbled. What have you been up to this week, Adam? Oh, you know, the usual a little bit of Rocket League. Uh, I finished the first episode of The Walking Dead game. And The Binding of Isaac Rebirth. I am back at The Binding of Isaac. Ah, love it. And in anticipation for the update they're they're going to be pushing out, um, I figured I'd get back into it a little bit. I suck now, like a lot. <laughs> I remember it's you playing definitely the other some night. rustiness. Yeah, 
not remembering the items, having to go to the cheat sheets. Yeah, well, I mean, there's so many items in that game, I never did play it enough to memorize them all. But, but yeah, I was having a lot of fun with it. I died a bunch of times to stupid stuff that I shouldn't have died to, because I hadn't played in a while. But after a little bit, I got less rusty, actually got through the chest, Oh, uh, did a whole run, yeah. Any mega but my, uh, No, no, I just did the, the regular chest. But um, uh, my post-it note, like the, the achievement tracker thing's all messed up, so I don't know what the deal is. That happened to me, actually, at one point, and it was really mm-hmm. frustrating because I had just went through and started actually focusing on, I hate playing as, like, Kane, for instance. I think it's Kane. Yeah. So I actually went through and got most of his shit. And then um, I think it was when I um, rebuilt my, or reformatted or rebuilt my computer, boom. Mm-hmm. I only had like half of the stuff I originally had. Yeah. So frustrating. Tom, did you ever play The Binding of Isaac? Um, I dabbled with it, yeah. but I never really got into it. Yeah. So here's a big it's, question. It's, an, it's weird, yeah. Did you play the first one? Yes. Yes. So the first one, while the game plays the same, feels a lot different. First one's a lot worse. It's on Flash. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. New one is not. I remember getting to points where very difficult rooms were made easy because the game would lag and just slow yeah. down. Uh, it would go uh, down to like 10 frames a second and you had all the time in the world to, to figure out what's going on and what's shooting at you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every time I try to get into a roguelike, you know, I've got this, this love affair with it for like two or three hours and then I just yeah. stop. Like, I love Rogue Legacy. I love the Castlevania type games and you throw it into a roguelike that just makes it so much better. But mm-hmm. I just stopped playing it. I just lost interest. And I, I don't know yeah. if it's the constant dying or, or what, but yeah, I, I just That's can't get one into thing it. that I don't like is you get all the way through, like you might even get far into it, but then you die and you have to start over and like all of your items are stripped away. And all of a sudden you're back to that crappy base damage, that low fire rate. And it's kind of a chore to get through the first the first floor or two until you kind of get back into the groove once See, you're used to going through so powerful. I really like it. I like my run-based mm-hmm. games. I like starting yeah. with nothing. I, Rogue Legacy is not quite the same because you naturally get stronger and stronger with different items as it goes. But mm-hmm. games like Enter the Gungeon, Binding of Isaac, you um, when you start over, you're fresh. You go as far yeah. as you can. You unlock new stuff. You die. You do it over again. To me, I view the first couple rooms that are not as boring to me because I kind of view it as this is what's going to set the game for me. Yeah, that's true. And if that I don't, first item room can make all the difference. Yes, after the first item room and first boss, if I don't have an item that I think something that can take me to end game, I restart. Mm-hmm. I don't. Oh, waste really? my t- I don't waste my time on a run that I don't think is going to be worth it. Like if so I you get- never know what you can get though. That's the beautiful of the. RNG. Yes, it is, but I mean, at the same time, you get like uh, the bean. Well, yeah, that's as a garbage your item, item room item. It's like what the hell? I can fart on enemies. Congratulations, I'm fucked. Yeah. Well, yeah, but there's the dice rooms. You can re-roll your whole run. You can turn just the worst, the worst item loadout into like all of the overpowered items at once. True. True. I'm just not that patient. Yeah, but I think well, that's part I, of the I, appeal I, to that game. Is, is it's like, like a big about, gamble. Um, one thing I do like about roguelikes in general is if I know I've got a very uh, you know set amount of time, I can't jump into a game of Dota where I could be locked in there anywhere from twenty five minutes to an hour and a half playing a single yeah. match that I can't leave. Uh, but <laughs> you know, if I've got five minutes to kill or ten minutes to kill, I can jump in Crypt of the Necro Dancer uh, or Spelunky. And leave without any consequence. I just I walk away because you know, who cares? I'll just play it again. Right. It's got a nice arcade feel to it. Yeah. The Binding of Isaac's a little different because some of their runs are longer than if you get a really good run, it could take you longer than it does to play a match of Dota. That's impressive. I've had depending runs on that- how much you want to like min max all your decisions and yeah get the most out of everything. Yeah. My best but you runs. Can, you can quit in the middle and save, and you can pick up where you left off. True. As true. long as you don't die. Let's say my best runs normally time in at around an hour. 
You see, I'm not oh, sure wow. I'm patient enough to do the min maxing stuff because I like even with Rogue Legacy, I, I run in and I try to kill everything as fast as possible, and, mm-hmm. and I do something dumb and kill myself, and I'm like, ah, oh, well, this sucks. I do that three or four times before I find something else to play. Yeah, I don't think I'm patient enough. Uh, you, it's you don't have to min max Isaac though. I mean, yeah, there's, there's actually incentives to go as quick as you can. Oh, that's to cool. a certain point. Yeah. If you get to a certain point before 20 minutes is up, you can get a an extra bonus thing you can try to do to get some extra items. Yeah, you can get two different or two extra items if you get there by 20. Mm-hmm. And honestly, but- Hush, um, after endgame, Hush takes you back in. So the same goes with Hush, where if you rush and get to Hush, you can get a ton of items and turn it into a Mega Satan run. Yeah, it's, it's super, cool. super. Useful. I love the decision making in that game. It's a lot of fun. One thing I, I liked about it that I saw was um, the doors with, with like teeth where, yeah, you yeah. can go to this part of the dungeon, but it'll cost you a hit. Yeah, it's, it's a nice little trade off and it doesn't always work out. No, it doesn't. I have found more times than not. It doesn't. But if you have the hearts to spare, yeah. if you have a bunch of laying around at the end of the, the floor before you go down to the next floor, you have a bunch of hearts laying around, but you're already full health. And then you get that opportunity to do the stuff like that. And that's exactly why it takes me an hour on good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I might have to give another shot after the, uh, the new update comes out. Yeah. I think that's launching January 7th is the after third. third. I think it's third. Yeah. We'll get into that a little bit later though. Cause there's a lot to talk about. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Good call. But uh, what have you been playing, Eric? Um, I've actually been doing a little bit of some stuff um, played through since I'm going to be out of town next week uh, f- to be prepared for the topic i went ahead and played through all of walking dead nice literally Marathoned in, it. um three sittings oh uh, wow takes about 12 hours um yeah we'll get into the specifics of that game but i was playing it strictly through big picture using a steam link with oh yeah a ps4 controller um we'll get into that but I will say that big picture in Steam Link, so fucking nice. Is it? It really so is. Nice. nice. I didn't have a spare uh, computer around, so just dropping the 50 bucks for the Steam Link was definitely worth it. Mm-hmm. Um, Bluetooth built in, so you can use your PS4, your 360, oh, cool. your Xbox One, not 360, your Xbox Ones. Mm-hmm. Um, all can plug into it. It's really nice. Really, really nice. I was able to sit on the couch, fireplace on, kick back with a beer, just <laughs> playing from the couch. Nice. Fantastic. Um, I did a little bit of um, Rocket League, and then I finished this weekend, this last weekend, finished The Last Guardian. Okay. I want to know what you think about this now that you've got yeah, it done. Yeah, tell us about this. So last time I talked about it, I had about two hours in. Mm-hmm. And now I'm talking about it and had about 14 hours in. Yeah. Um, if you look at our Twitch, you will see that I had two huge fucking goes at it to finish the game. <laughs> um, so there's a lot there. This yeah. game is, um, it's technically not Team Echo, Ico, but it is. It's their uh, lead designer. Mm-hmm. Um, this controls much like I've always heard of Shadow Colossus in them, where yeah. it's I, I say clunky, heavy, however you want to word it, controls. When you push to the right, your character starts running, and then he has to stop. So if you just press it for a second, it's going to take like a second and a half of motion. Yeah. The camera is very interesting. If you get put to a situation where the camera might glitch through a wall, they instead will black it out and try to move it for you. Oh, so this it sounds pre- like it could be oh. frustrating. So this prevents it from glitching out, but mm-hmm. this game has some tight corridors. I had a spot where the screen was just black and I had to climb based on where I thought I was. Oh, I, was no. in, I was in no threat and I was climbing on Trico. So that was the reason it was. It wasn't like I was climbing on a set piece. Set pieces yeah. don't have the issue. Still, I thought we solved camera issues back in the N64 era. I didn't think, you know, <laughs> really bad camera in a third-person game was still a thing. Well, there's a little bit of a difference where they allow you to completely move the camera where you wanted. In some of those instances, the wall, you will be in a corner, and the camera just has to get out of there. 
rather than just snapping, it blacks out and then moves the camera. It's their way of handling it. That's a weird design decision. Well, it's weird, and also this comes to something else. This game feels very much like a PS3 game. Yeah. The way it controls, the way it feels. Um, now, I'm not using it as a slight, but mm-hmm. it just def- definitely feels how it is. That, um, I wonder why that is. Well, it's been Maybe because it was for... supposed to be a PS3 launch title? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Whoops. I, I was that. Whoops. It's been in development for, you know, eight years. Um, but so that, that's some of the bad, the only other bad thing. Um, so I'll give a little preface to this and my theory behind it. So this game does, it loads once and that's it. You go, if you don't die, you will never load until you get to one of the like three cutscenes, which hmm, is really kind nice. of cool. But every once in a while you will notice your frame rate will drop. Like I referenced before. It's mm. noticeable. I, it's in single digits some people are reporting. I'm thinking what's happening in these spots is when they're deciding to switch some of the scene in the buffer and actually load in more of the scene. So it's taking a performance hit on that. I've heard that someone talking sense. about being on a PS4 Pro in 1080 and not having the issue. Put it mm. up to 4K, they had the issue, and playing on a standard PS4, you had an issue. Yeah. So I'm thinking oh. it's just taking too much ass to load in the new part of the scene. It's all the 4K textures. And that made it through quality control? I think it was a design decision. Rather than have a load screen, they would rather have frame rates drop. And honestly... Oh. I'll I'm sit not, on the load screen. I don't yeah, know. Same. It's, it's only for about three seconds. I actually kind of appreciate that decision if that is what's causing it. I but couldn't it's, they... I mean, those load they do zones something to happen. optimize it? Um, well, I'm sure they could. It, it takes, it takes time to do that stuff though. What you yeah. have to and start the game was already, you know, delayed to the hilt. You would mm-hmm. have to start anticipating where the player's going and loading that in there and take away from past when this game actually has a lot of times you will go back someplace where you've been. Mm-hmm. So they don't want to clear that out. So if you go in, it's there. But what about like the graphics options? Couldn't they have done something to the lessen the overall tax on the system so, so that those issues wouldn't happen? I don't know. They they possibly could have. This game's not how to word this. It's not beautiful. It's not graphically like uh, realistic, ultra realistic. Mm-hmm. This is very Wind Waker esque when it comes to its beauty. So I'm not 100 percent sure on how much the visuals are what it is. If that makes sense, it's not like they're trying to make mm-hmm. these super like high uh, pixel count objects. Hmm. But um, now, do you ever hit these frame rate drops when you're in an action sequence or something where you need to react? No, 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 no. It is okay. always in a uh, very low key environment. That's why I'm thinking okay. it's them switching yeah. it out, and that's why I'm also okay with it. Yeah, yeah. like if, I say, if it takes place in the middle of a battle, you know, getting to single digit frames is death. Well, yeah. battle. Huh. I'll get there in a second. But yeah, like if it happened <laughs> in a platforming sequence, it'd be bad. Yeah. So I, I will say spoiler just in case. I don't think it is. Cup your ears for five seconds. There's no battles. Trico fights everything for you is how that works. Huh. Because you're not a type of character that's designed to do that. That is not your objective in this game. You're a little boy. Mm-hmm. Um, but so that's all the bad. There is a ton of good in this. Um, the way Trico acts is phenomenal. Um, that AI is modeled really, really well. Uh, some people get frustrated with saying Trico doesn't respond to them well. I'm wondering if it's just that they're not quite set right on it because I had very little issues with Trico not responding to me. Yeah. After the first like hour. Well, I wonder that that team does this thing where the character, the the gameplay of the character advances or gets better the further in the game it goes. And there's not a technical reason for that. It's actually story driven. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in in Eco, um, 
you know, you're the, the female companion that you're with it. She's, she's slow and she shuffles along at the very start of the game. And she's very hesitant to do anything by the end of the game. She's jumping over cliffs with you holding your hand and, you know, being as awesome and stellar as you are when it comes to, you know, platforming and acrobatic stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was, it was a story design decision to say, look, these two are forming a bond and it gets better over time. So if Trico is not responding in the beginning of the game, but he's responding very well at the end of the game, that could very well be a story element. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, it's not quite like that where it'd be a story. It's just, some of these things, the puzzle wise, it's weird. Um, so you'll see the puzzle. And what people are having an issue with is they're commanding Trico to move. He doesn't. They'll hmm. command him to move to the puzzle spot again. He won't. So they'll anticipate, well, he's not going there. That's not the right solution. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, it is. Yeah. So it's, unknown, it's unknown at this point if it's program disobedience or there's also. You feed Trico as you go, these little barrels you find in around that are filled with something. Um, you don't have to always feed him. There's certain spots where it forces you to, but you don't always have to. Mm-hmm. So I was also wondering if the amount of barrels you give him increases the responsibleness because I gave probably. him a lot that I didn't have to. I would say probably, yeah. That and I think a lot of people, yeah. And I, I, uh, I listened to some other people talk about this game. Some of it might be, too, that people are just trying to spam commands at him because he's not doing it initially, where they need to give Trico a command and give him time to go through whatever animations he needs to go through. The AI probably is programmed for him to uh, look around for a while before he does it or hesitate or things like that. And by spamming a bunch of commands, it's just forcing him to go through another iteration of whatever AI that's the command is going through. I'm sure that, you know, they modeled the AI after, you know, screaming at a dog incessantly. Yeah. It doesn't make the dog work any faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wonder if that's part of it, too. Um, I can actually see that being a part of it, because some of these animations are very long. Yeah. Like, there's this one jump sequence you do with him, and um, it took probably a good 5-10 seconds for him to set up the jump. And he's moving the whole time, and he's doing, like, this mm-hmm. little ear flicker that, mm-hmm. if you paid attention, kind of cues in that he's lining up a jump. Yeah. Also, side note, that thing is more cat than dog. The more and more I really? play that game, that <laughs> thing is a fucking cat bird, not a dog bird. I think it's a cat dog bird. Cat dog. So, <laughs> do you feel justified in your, you know, your launch purchase of this game, or is it one of those that you should wait for a sale? So, it it depends on what type of game you like. Uh, this is a yeah. puzzle game that has an AI that you interact with it, you may never come across again. It was very well done. I enjoyed the game thoroughly. Um, the, the way they told the story was very interesting. Uh, the narration was really nice. Um, the outside of the clunkiness of the controls, it was very good. So I would buy it again, launch myself, but I like puzzly games. Yeah. Very little action in this game. So you'd have to be a patient person. You can't be one of those people that's like, I need my instant gratification. Where is it? Where's yeah. my so, points? So you shouldn't buy <laughs> you should buy this on its own merits, not as a sequel to Shadow of the Colossus. Correct. As well okay. as don't buy this game because it was hyped up for so long. Yeah. If you're buying this game based on the hype, you will be let down. It is a very good game, but you will be let down if you buy it based on the hype. Anything that's been in development that long is almost never going to live up to the hype. Except for Half Life 3, which will obviously. (laughs) Sorry, I just just I heard something. Okay, really bad. um, I will say this is not an early access game. This game is complete. This game does not need any foundation. There's not an update that has to happen months later (laughs) that adds the rest of the game in. So, was the story actually good? Like you said, it was presented well, but is the story interesting? Is it good? Um, to provoke thought a little bit a little bit yeah. of thought um it's kind of, i like the mechanism how they do it there's definitely something mm-hmm. at the end that's like a oh fuck kind of moment yeah yeah that's par for the course for for these games yeah, I that's don't how shadow of the colossus was i don't want to call it a, a series because they're not like directly like hooked up end to end but they yeah. kind of exist in the same space 
the the story of of Eco was was great, not because the story was great, but it was it was really telling, you know, or showing rather, you know, how these two people uh, started off as complete strangers and then you know became best friends over the course of a single game, and it it was that that was the story. So my parting words is: if you enjoy puzzles, pick it up. And for the developers, whoever came up with the idea of having the normal team eco or ICO control scheme and adding platforming elements to it, you're a fucking asshole. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> they did it in, in Eco. They did it in Shadow of the Colossus. It's been that way for yeah. every game in this series. And Shadow of the Colossus was primarily climbing around on things. Yes. The climbing but the I didn't have a problem with it, though. I didn't have a problem with it. I mean... I think once you get over the the mental barrier that, you know, this will not control like a third person action game. Like it it doesn't control how it looks like it should control. And Mm -hmm. it's not as responsive as something like Mario uh, or Uncharted or Tomb Raider or the new Tomb Raiders. Um, Yeah. As soon as you get past that mental barrier, it's okay, but it's, it feels heavy. It feels different. There was a one part in this game that took me 20 to 30 minutes. If you go to the stream, you'll notice that I muted my mic at one point. <laughs> <laughs> That's I beautiful. was getting pissed. Yeah. And there's actually this little thing where if you hit the wall when you're hitting the ledge you're supposed to grab, he won't grab it if you're up against the wall as well. Oh, no. And the way this camera works, it was a safety net mechanism to go towards the wall so you don't overshoot. Mm. It was painful. Uh, <laughs> I'm disappointed in the camera. I mean, that, that sounds terrible. In a third-person game, that's just breaking. Yeah, that, I mean, that is the worst part of the game. That said, it doesn't ruin the game. Yeah. It made that one plant platforming part very difficult. I haven't looked to see if anyone else has had that issue, but for me, that was hell. Uh, okay, so that is all I've been playing, and that was a long spell in The Last Guardian. No, that's okay. We need, we need I know that. nothing about it. We needed so. that, yeah. I plan on doing a uh, review for everyone, in case you want to know. It will be up on YouTube shortly after I get back from Christmas break. By Christmas break, I mean uh, Christmas vacation. I'm not in school. There is no freaking break. (laughs) Christmas break. (laughs) Yay. Yeah, my last company, we actually had a Christmas break. Nice. I'm kind of on a Christmas break now. In a tech shop, you had a Christmas (laughs) break? (laughs) <laughs> well, you see, we were connected to like factories in China, and China shut down for two weeks for Chinese New Year. So that was our Christmas break. China shut down. The entirety of the country <laughs> shut down. Okay, it, okay everything, during, everything here's, shut down. Here's here's some education for you. Some non video game related education. Um, in China, the Chinese New Year is like the biggest deal ever, and literally the country grinds to a halt. Everyone travels. It's like Christmas here. You don't expect like big business to get done, you know, during the last couple weeks of December. That's how Chinese mm-hmm. New Year is. So when nice. that hits, everything shuts down. Wow. At Nationwide, they're very big um, on multicultural, all that. Man, for Chinese New Year, every year, I always had to help hang the decorations around the floors with all the Chinese <laughs> lanterns and stuff. It, it was a... Definitely a festival. Yeah. Uh, but outside of playing games, we have some news. News. Nintendo has broken in with the game finally on the mobile platforms. But they Mario had a game Run. before on the mobile platforms. This is not Nintendo's first foray. Did anyone play Mito- Mitomo? No That's one? not a game. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo <laughs> did make a mobile app of some kind. There you go. I'll give you that. Mobile app. <laughs> and before anyone tries to chime in Pokemon Go, that is Niantic, which is Nintendo and Pokemon branding. Yeah. yeah. It's the Pokemon company, which Nintendo doesn't own. They just have like a 33% stake in or something like that. Which is yeah. still but enough it is, to make a shit ton. It is still big news because uh, it is the first uh, officially sanctioned Mario game on a non Nintendo platform. Yeah. I think any of you, did either of you get to play it? I do not have an iOS device and it I, does not come out for Android until next year sometime. I was yeah. very tempted to go to an iStore to try it because this <laughs> looks good. Yeah. This isn't the endless runner that they were talking about for a while. 
Mm -hmm. Because I was when they say endless runner, my brain goes to Temple Run. Yeah, it seems a little bit more in depth. Mine mine goes to Cannabalt. Never played it. Oh, that was that was well. I'm sure it's not the original uh, Endless Runner, but it was one of the the first ones that I knew about. Yeah. But the cool thing about this, it's not endless. There is a set level at the end. Right. There is a flag you jump up on and you try to get to the top. Nice. One thing that I do like uh, what Nintendo did with this game is they didn't do the, you know, they didn't ballot the pressures of the app store uh, to unlock the full game. So you download the free, you know, Super Mario Run app and you get a couple levels for free. Uh, but then to unlock the rest of the game, you have to do an in-app purchase, which for most mobile games would be, you know, a buck, maybe two bucks. Maybe if it's a crazy, awesome mobile game, it's five dollars. Mm-hmm. Nintendo said, hey, guys, we're Nintendo. Ten big ones. You got to fork over ten dollars for this game. Uh, so I am happy that they are actually charging real money for real experiences on the App Store. So did you guys see some of the Twitter backlash about that? Oh, the pricing? <laughs> yeah. No, no. There are people going nuts saying, oh my God, this is so expensive. Why is it like that? It should only be two bucks. People it's forget. $10. It's a video game. You play it on your phone. Yeah. I don't care. It's a fucking video game still. Okay. It depends on the quality and depth of gameplay too, because yeah. most mobile games don't deserve $10 because most of yeah. them are not very well done. They're not very good games. Let's put it this way. If they were to allow you to choose to run back and forth with a D-pad and put this mm. on a console, this would look like this new Super Mario, new Super Mario Brothers genre. The, like, the, and, for yeah. the Wii you, and Wii you know U. What it, you know what it would cost? It would cost at least $40. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, that, I, so that's cool, though. It kind of legitimizes the mobile game market yeah, a little bit. Yes. I applaud Nintendo for sticking to their guns and for not bowing to the the pressures of the market on this one. I, I think it's it's going to be a good thing for you know legitimate mobile game developers everywhere. But in typical Nintendo fashion, for every one good thing they do, <laughs> they have to at least do one thing terribly wrong. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah, I know one. Terribly um, wrong. You have to be online to play Super Mario Run. If you do not have a good internet connection, you cannot play. This is fucking bullshit. <laughs> so. I ha- can't experiment with it yet, and I'm sure it'll eventually be made this way a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I'm wondering if you authenticate initially when you boot up the app, if it would work. Because then that uh, means, like, for I, a lot of the podcasts I listen to are people in New York, and they want to be able to play stuff while they're going through the tunnels. Mm-hmm. They can't play this going through the tunnels. Correct. And it, okay, so I, I get it. I, I really understand Nintendo's apprehension if they release this on Android first, because people just rip APKs and put them up on sites all the time uh, yeah. for all kinds of paid apps. I mean, most of that stuff is laden with malware. So if you're you know downloading paid games for free, uh, your phone's probably jacked up. So wipe that. Uh, but this isn't my security show. So um, <laughs> we're, we're talking about the, the iPhone here, right? Ripping apps, putting them on, you know, one of the jailbroken app stores. That, that's not common, right? That's a very, very small subset of users to be able to, to effectively pirate a paid app on iOS. Nintendo yeah. doesn't need to worry about this shit. Why do they even? Oh, I disagree who, with that. On, on top of that, who cares? For the six people that pirate this game, right, and jailbreak their iPhone just to play pirated Mario? Come on. Really? It's not. I think a lot of it was because of the Android platform. But also, Nintendo is notorious for having easily broken games and systems. The 3DS, the DS, the Wii, the Wii U. All have oh the Wii U is a little not as nice, but they all have homebrew channels. They all have cracks. Hell, they're giving what was it, thirty thousand or something like that dollars to any um, developer that comes forward with an exploit for the 3DS to them instead of releasing it, which they should have been doing forever. I mean, bug bounties are the way to you know buy off would be black hats. Yeah. Actually, Rocket League, there was uh, somebody that pointed out a pretty 
big deal bug and they gave out a exclusive white hat item. Nice. There's like three there's three total white hat items. That's in fantastic the game for those people. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean I get their worry because the Wii was incredibly easy to jailbreak. So easy. Mm-hmm. And they're just tired of their systems getting thrown around. I think they're finally starting to try to do more security on it. Not in the best way. If this, this, it depends on how they implement it. And I know this isn't a technology podcast, but I'm going to break this down simply. Uh, If, if all it is, is the app asks a server, Hey, can I reach you? That means I'm online, right? Uh, and, and the server comes back with, yeah, you're good, and it sounds like a serial number or something. The only thing you have to do it, on a jailbroken device is is redirect that internally, so with like DNS poisoning, which this it sounds complicated, it's really easy stuff to, to just point this internally to a server that would emulate Nintendo's response to say, yeah, you're all clear, dude, go ahead and play Mario. I, this stuff gets broken anyway. So why put forth the effort? The, the way to combat piracy is to make your shit easy to download. Don't throw in DRM that screws over people trying to play on the goddamn subway and make a good game that people want to pay for out of the gate. That, that, those are the only ways to effectively combat piracy. Nintendo is just clinging to the past like they've always done. But they're getting closer. They are yeah. getting closer. And supposedly the game is actually fun. So that's good. The, the one big complaint I heard about it was if you do play it, and it's not designed to be played through this way, but if you do play it straight through in one shot in about an hour, uh, you can complete the game. Not get all the achievements, but you can get through all the levels. Uh, yeah. So it is fairly short for what it is. That said, it's a mobile game. You're supposed to get in, get out, you know, play five, ten minutes at a time. Yeah. But hopefully this helps legitimize a scene for the mobile games. Yeah. I'm hoping. Also, there was an up or soon to be update that we kind of hinted at with Binding of Isaac. And I think yes. Adam himself knows quite a bit about this. Yeah, actually, I just have the page up, but still. Um, Afterbirth Plus is going to be released on January 3rd, and it's going to cost $10. If you already have the game, it's going to cost $6.66. It's going to have 67 new items, 27 new trinkets, 10 plus new pickups, 4 more bosses, a new final boss, a new final area, 2 transformations, a new character, hundreds of new rooms, (laughs) new monsters, challenges, achievements, all this stuff. Hard mode for greed mode, uh, daily greed mode runs, bestiary that shows information on monsters. Uh, this one's called a victory lap mechanic. So players who have beaten the dark room can start over with all their items intact and increase game game difficulty. I love so you get that to the idea. you get to the last final area and you loop back to the beginning with harder enemies and the items you already had. So, this so that is, could be cool. This is paid DLC, right? Yes, yeah. yes, it is paid yeah. mini DLC. Yeah. Um, they, and they did probably the. I was going to say, they did something similar to this on the first Binding of Isaac, where they had a very substantial DLC come out for it. Yeah, added Afterbirth was, too. Yes. The yes. initial Afterbirth update was, too. I mean, most, most DLC, and I, I love the developers behind uh, you know, Binding of Isaac and Super Meat Boy. Those guys mm. are just fucking Yeah, they're mad. awesome. <laughs> um, but you know, most DLC is, Hey, look guys, you can pay $6 and dress up Isaac in a cool outfit. And they're like, yeah. Hey, you can pay this small amount of money and you get an entirely new game. It yeah. Sounds rad. Yeah. They, it, I, they've done a few of these kind of updates for the first and the second game. And it's always a blast. There's so much new stuff to discover and play through. Um, it resparks the interest in the game. If you're bored with it, like I was, that I wasn't f- bored with it, but that victory lap mechanic I think will be interesting because you, oh, get, yeah. you get some combinations that you go through and you hit the very oh, end yeah, and you're just like, I'm so fucking strong. This last part's easy. Yeah. The and last it, final boss, you could like almost one shot if you get a su- super broken, crazy run. And it'd be interesting to see at what point it actually dials it up to say, fuck you and right. makes it hard again. And if I know anything of the binding of Isaac, they will do so. <laughs> <laughs> but the coolest part of the update various features for modding support including an item pull editor a room editor an animation editor lua support whatever that is custom challenge creator 
and a monthly update to the game implementing the best mod into the game permanently. That's huge. So they are letting people create the mods mods of their own with all these tools provided to them and every month they're going to pick the best one and put it in the game permanently. I that's so cool. Really cool. It's such a cool idea. This is going to make this game the game that you always pull off the shelf every couple months. Yeah. Just to see what the fuck's going on. Yeah. This this is the most brilliant evergreen gaming strategy I've ever seen. Oh yeah. This is great. A lot of companies have tried this, but they've never said, yeah, we're just going to let modders run the game from mm-hmm. now on. Well, this it's, is it's, nuts. Yes. It's perfect for a game like this, too, because it started off as a Flash game. Uh, it was like that for a couple years, and they did the whole revamp version of it, which improved it in every way. And then they do all these DLCs attached to that, and then this is... I doubt they would do another DLC after this one. But then they're giving all the modding tools to the community. The community can create the additional content they want to. It's a win-win. The community gets more content every month. The game developers take some uh, weight off their shoulders, so to speak. They don't have to do as much. And they can focus on what other other games they're working on. And it's kind of a win-win. So This is a fantastic what- idea. Of all the things you said, is the um, outside of the mod support, what are you looking the most forward to? Ooh. Because for me... That's tough. I love transformations. So getting two more transformations to me is amazing. I I mean, I want to just say the new items and stuff because that's half the fun is exploring and finding new items that you didn't know what they were and you figure out what they do and how they interact and... But that or the victory the victory lap mechanic could be cool. New final chapter. I'm excited to see what that is. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. That's yeah. going to be really weird. Mm-hmm. Because... Really, I think what I'm looking most forward to is the day I install that update and I'm playing and I'm discovering things again. And this is a fun game. If you have other people you know that have it, yeah. jump, oh, in, yeah. jump in a Discord server talk to each other while you're playing it's just really fun to find what other people are getting the synergies between items in this game is unbelievable Mm -hmm. and if you jump in with your friends too if you start a run um it gives you a seed and if your friend puts in that code for that seed they can play the same run as you all the the random generations will be the same Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So you can play through and you both get to well what floor are you you on? Oh yeah, I'm already over on floor number four. I'm still on two. What items did you pick up in that first item room? Oh no, I got this instead. I re-rolled it to this item. It's yeah. it's really cool to see how um how far how it can differ. Yeah. Yeah. How far the same exact game can go. Mm-hmm. Uh Tom, you so, yeah, this should this should be now. a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm gonna have to get into this now. This sounds just too rad to pass up. Uh, so we also, for the news, had a real quick hitter. Um, Steam is bringing DualShock 4 support native into Steam. Yes, no longer in beta. I set it up, actually, like 15 minutes before we started this cast. <laughs> it's cool. I mean, it's nice to have that, that support for that controller. Um, you can edit all the buttons. You can select what the trackpad does, all that kind of stuff. The color of the LED on the back when you have it plugged in. I did so. not tune it, but I have used it, and mm-hmm. it is absolutely plug and play. Yeah. If you don't want Good. to tweak with anything and you just want it just to map just like a 360 or Xbox One controller, plug it in and go. I've been looking for a good Bluetooth controller to hook to my phone, to my computer, and I wanted something wireless that's rechargeable because I've got mm-hmm. wired 360 controllers right now, and I think I might just buy a couple of DualShock 4s, call it done. It's a nice controller. I like it. And apparently they're really durable, too. Like oh, I've heard good. of people breaking their Xbox controllers, Xbox One controllers over time, but I've heard, I've heard that they're, they're solid. I like it a lot. I still say my favorite controller is that um, Xbox One Elite. Mm-hmm. But buying a $100 controller is really pricey. But well, damn, like that controller more than that. Isn't it more than $100? Isn't no. it like 120 or 150 it, when it first came out, I'm pretty sure it was only a hundred. Oh, I, shouldn't okay. say, I shouldn't say only. It is a hundred. Okay, <laughs> that's not as bad as I thought it was. It's really nice. So it's got double paddles for the triggers. If you want it, you can actually turn on turbo modes and such. 
Mm-hmm. It's real good. I really wish more game companies would put out like a a really nice controller like Microsoft did. Because uh, mm-hmm. just looking at that makes me jealous. I just I yeah. really want that in a well Razer factor. Razer's releasing two new controllers f- for that kind of reason. Okay. The party. There's a there's a PS4 kind of layout one, and there's an Xbox Xbox kind of layout one. Um, I don't remember the names of them, but they're kind of they're marketed towards like the esports scene and the the higher level. Yeah, and I'm assuming like it's extra like, buttons on the back, customization, yeah. and stuff like that. And that was a cool thing about the Microsoft one. It was first party that gave you that. You can mm-hmm. switch out your thumbsticks. You can switch out your D pad. You can actually adjust the um on the triggers. You can adjust the actuation point a little bit and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It's really yeah. cool. And it also weighed a fucking ton for a controller. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to look at that. So I, yeah, I, DualShock 4 support. Very nice. That's, that's rad. I'm going to have to pick some of those up. And then for Tom's favorite game of all time, and for anyone <laughs> who's been under a rock and or just doesn't care about Dota, sorry, that's Dota okay. 3 <laughs> has released. Yes. Wow. So, so uh, yeah, Dota 3. Valve can count, but only... <laughs> Only in version numbers. Yeah, so it's technically Dota 2 version 7. But this is the first time the game is taking a departure away from something they could not take back to Warcraft 3. This is them officially saying, fuck it, we can never go back. Yeah, this is... uh, This changed the entire game of Dota 2. Uh, I... I heard that the new patch was big, so I listened to a uh, a Dota podcast and like, yeah, so uh, the new patch just dropped, um, and we had some of our guys do a patch analysis on Twitch that we converted to a podcast. That'll come out tomorrow. Uh, it's about seven hours, though, so you know, block out some time. I was like, what the fuck? A seven-hour podcast? Are you nuts for patch analysis? There's no way. They, they, there's no way. They're full of shit. Uh, no, seven hours, and they, like, crammed they went full force and as fast as they could to try to get all of this news in which we are not even going to touch no. uh, most of this stuff but dota 2 is an entirely new game if you haven't played it before uh give it a shot now because you're going to come in on the ground floor basically everyone's been reset to zero yeah so still some skill familiarity helps um all the all heroes were affected all heroes were changed. The abilities have stayed the same, like your um, base four QWER, or however you have it laid. But now, every 5, 10, 15, and 20, you get to choose of one or two, tr- one of two traits that permanently stick with your hero. And these vary for every hero. Like, some of them will say, oh, at level 20, you put your point here, you'll get 20 extra damage. Or you put it here, you will get an extra 150 gold to kill and stuff like that. So it really changes the entire dynamic of the game. So depending on how you want to play, depending on the team matchup, because there are there aren't hard and fast rules in Dota. There's a lot of sort of understood rules, but those get turned on their heads all the time, and especially at major competitions. Um, so you could be running one character as a support, but it turns out he's really great against this other person, and you've built him a strange way, and now you kind of want to move him into more of a, a core, like, I'm going to murder everyone on the map kind of role. And you can do that with the new uh, the new traits, uh, which are the the just insane. Um, you can really change everything about your hero now. And one big thing that will hit the pro scene and maybe some of the better non-professional players that are just really good at microing from playing StarCraft and other types of games of that nature, they added a backpack. So if you already have six items, that's all you can have previously. Now you can actually have items into your backpack. Typical use that they had planned for was things like... um, recipes and being able to combine items so you wouldn't have to drop things on the ground but for people who can really micro i expect them to start storing actual items they plan on using in their backpack and switching it in when they need it there's a six second cooldown when you switch 
but six seconds, put your Dagon in, blast it away, and switch it out as soon as you blast. Things like that I start seeing to happen. Well, keep in mind that cooldowns in your backpack are vastly expanded. So if you put something in your backpack and wait for it to cool down, you're going to be waiting a much longer time. That said, for a one-time use like that, or for something like a necro book where you don't have to use it all the time, uh, that ends up working out pretty well. So that this update is just gigantic. I mean, I just can't say it enough. I like to jungle myself, and they've raised the price of my primary item, the Morbid Mask, by 33%, while reducing the spawns in the jungle by double. They added an ca- ancient camp in there, so it's just one of these things where I don't know how it's going to shake out. In my head, well, jungling's the- been weakened, but they added an ancient, so later in the game it gets stronger. So the new ancient camp is interesting because it does have this weird aura. Usually in Dota, you do what's called stacking, which is actually a bug in the Warcraft 3 engine that got turned into a strategy in Dota, and they carried it over to Dota 2, and it's a like a high-level skill. Um, it's where you can attack an enemy and run away, and they will chase you, and as long as they're outside this little square zone uh, and nothing else is in there... Um, new enemies will spawn, meaning there will be now, uh, you know, two sets of these enemies in one little area. Uh, So what people would do, especially at the pro level, is they would get, you know, stacks on stacks on stacks and just get tons of these little enemies in a little area just so one guy, like their big hero that's supposed to kill everyone and win the game for him, can go in and get a bunch of XP and gold right in one area without, you know, too much risk. These new ancients that they added actually buff anything in there and that aura stacks so if you've got too many of those new types of ancients in there these things become almost impossible to kill so doing this you know giant 10 stack isn't really a valid strategy anymore it'll shake out the next major in kiev will be on this patch and honestly, this is the way this scene tends to go. We'll see how the pros play it, and that'll trickle down into the publics. Yeah, this, I mean, I can't go through. I, we literally do not have the time to go through everything. Um, but uh, they also changed a ton of stuff in the map. Uh, Roshan no longer has a dire side advantage. It is 100% neutral. It, he literally sits in the middle of the river. It's it's really weird to see it when you're playing the game. Uh, both jungles have multiple you know high ground and low ground areas. Uh, there are many fountains called shrines spread throughout the land. Uh, more rune spots everywhere. I just this stuff well, is all over the place. The rune spots are still only one for. They split the runes into two different categories now. You have power up runes, haste, double damage, invisibility, all that. And then you have bounty runes. Bounty runes have been split off into the jungles, into four separate spawns, two in each side. But the power-up is still one lower central, I heard. Yes. Into the river, that's what I meant. Yeah, Yeah. so there, you've got the two power-up spots in the river, and only one will activate at a time. Uh, so it, you don't get two power-ups going at the same time. It does make things a little bit more even between Dire and Radiant. We'll have to see how this works out. It looks like they're really... I don't know how to feel about this. The last patch in Dota, um, on one hand, started to feel really stale and boring uh, for, you know, the past couple weeks, you know, month, two months, because it was almost perfect. It was almost balanced, and Icefrog, the main developer, said, hey guys, hold my beer. And he launched the, the, you know, Dota 7.0 patch where it just, it fucked everything. So no one knows how this game is going to be played at the pro level anymore. Um, it, watching pros on Twitch play the new patch uh, with, with a brand new UI, uh, you know, some of them are like, wow, this is kind of nice. And a lot of them are like, wow, this is dog shit. Everything changed. And I'm an esports player. What the fuck, Valve? This is literally my <laughs> livelihood. You are fucking with my job right now. <laughs> so, how, do you, how do you guys keep track of all this stuff? It sounds like it's not even a game. It's a lifestyle because of how much information you have to keep in your head and learn. So I, I, I'm, 
Go go ahead, Eric. So, I, I, put <laughs> in, my stats. I put in a what well for most games it would be a decent amount of time, but in Dota, not really. I put in nine hundred hours into Dota. And I'm still knowledge wise very like on the lower end of the totem pole. Mm-hmm. This game takes a huge amount of time to get super good at. It doesn't yeah, take a lot I, of time to have fun with. It takes a lot of time to get good at. I think you can start to have fun with Dota maybe after the 40-hour mark. I don't which know. Sounds, <laughs> which sounds terrible, but you know, I, I am, a, I am the, a super noob at Dota uh, with you know, nearly 750 hours into the game. Uh, there are people that are like, yeah, I'm, I'm okay at Dota. I'm about mid-level. I, I'm about, you know, 3K MMR, uh, which is, you know, definitely below the pro scene um, it, with, you know, 3,500 hours in it. It's like, yeah, I, I usually put in, you know, two or three games a day. It's like, dude, so, do you have time to do anything else? So Dota <laughs> used to be rough to get into to learn, like Tom handed that with the 40 hours. But since it first, when they went to the uh, Source 2 engine, they added some extra tutorials to help teach. And then again, with this update, they added some more. So there's plenty of ways that they're helping you learn without having to play. And then they also have bots, which is one last thing I want to say. Dota is now introducing potentially a new type of tournament for esports where the players are not human. They have opened up the ability for players to write their own AI scripts. This and is they're huge. already talking, certain areas are talking about doing AI tournaments, where your script versus my script in an entire bracket of scripts. StarCraft has done this for, you know, a decade or more at this point with people trying to make StarCraft AI, which is actually, it's, it's way harder than it sounds. Um, and I, I think, you know, making AI battles for Dota is the next evolution of that. I think it'd just be kind of cool to just see two AIs go at it and just watching what they do. Yeah. But I was also the kid that would turn Madden on and simulate a game and just kind of clean, <laughs> clean the apartment and watch it while I clean. I did that once when I was younger. Yeah, I've done that. So uh, I, I really like there's a lot of quality of life stuff that definitely makes Dota easier to get into. Uh, so when they move to the Source 2 engine, your little, you know, hero picker thing in the game and where you would go to look up stuff about your hero and change cosmetics, stuff like that. There are two totally different interfaces. So if you knew where your dude was when you're learning about him and, you know, outside of the game and picking him. It wasn't, you know, hard to find, but it just, it was too different. Uh, now those uh, user interfaces are, um, are are the same thing. Uh, and what's really cool is they've got little filters at the bottom. So you're like, okay, cool. I want to play. I know I'm going to need a support. Uh, and I want him to be, you know, to be a disabler and an initiator. So you can click on those things and it'll highlight the heroes that match that. Let's say you want like a light support or the hardest support. Um, you can, you know, say, give me a support of level three and it'll, it'll do that. They also added a, uh, a new filter for complexity. So there are heroes that are way harder to use than other heroes in Dota. And you can say, okay, I'm a noob. Give me level one complexity uh, and sort of filter down from there. It's it's lots of great quality of life stuff. Uh, beyond that, you now have a strategy phase after you all pick your heroes, where you can you know your team is forced instead of doing it during the pick phase. You guys get thirty seconds to say, okay, I'm going to this lane. We're going to ward over here. This is going to be our first moves, and you get to buy your starting items in that thirty seconds. So you don't have to waste time before the game and you know memorize all the map spots. You can get right into it and it loads instantly now um it, it, lots of little quality of life improvements uh there's no better time to get into dota aside from never if you don't want to lose your life <laughs> yeah this is this is not a you know a, a casual game by any means you can play it casually but if if you want to if you want to get good uh You'll have to put in some time. I've only played two matches this patch just because I can't do the time commitment right now. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, 30 minutes to an hour per game. Uh, in this patch, games do tend to go faster. Um, before, uh, you know, my average game was 60 to 70 minutes. In this patch, uh, it's about 40. So, yeah, and that's probably just because I suck and I, I'm dragging down my team. But, you know, what can you do? They lowered the, <laughs> they lowered the experience you needed per level. So they definitely did some things to get you to level faster. So that could be part of it. Keeping people interested while they're reading the encyclopedia of Dota information. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, also, we completely glossed over the fact that there's a brand new hero in Dota 2. Uh, Monkey King. Monkey King. He's a dick. King of monkeys. He can climb I... up on trees and hit people. He's a monkey. So, uh, so when he climbs up on the trees, you, you can't see him unless your character is a flying character with flying vision. Which, by the way, that's like three people. So he's effectively invisible, hanging out on top of a tree, watching everyone run around below him. He's got this ability that lets him... Uh, it's, it's called mischief. It, the game looks at the whatever area you're in and disguises you. So you can run into the trees, hit mischief, and it turns him into a tree. <laughs> and he just blends in with the environment, so you're nice. running past him, and he's just like, oh, hi, dude, and he wrecks you. Until the esports players memorize all the tree layouts and exactly. be like, well, that one's not supposed to yeah. be there. Yeah. But um, how does the uh, character selection work in Dota? Like, can, can more multiple people be the same hero? No. No? Okay. So how does that work? It's whoever clicks it first? Uh, it depends on the game type. So okay. in, in uh, normal, unranked, all pick. It's whoever clicks it first. In mm -hmm. ranked all pick, each team takes a turn picking one of their heroes. Okay. Um, in captain's mode, there's an entire pick ban system that you have to weave through, okay. and that takes like three or four minutes, that's, and then you start the game. That's that good. Is, I was worried that there could be multiple, and then you just start a game, and literally everybody is just the uh, the monkey king or whatever. <laughs> Everyone oh, is no. in true form, waiting for the next person <laughs> just, to just, walk yeah, by. Just sitting there, nothing ever gets done. <laughs> but uh, because it's it's a brand new hero, and this happens every time a hero is like uh, severely updated uh, mm -hmm. or a new hero comes out in every single game that you play now, monkey king is in it, guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Oh, Which is, it's really annoying because he's a new hero, so you don't know exactly how to work around him. Yeah. I just, he wrecked my shit today. It was bad. It's just <laughs> like after every big tournament when there's a good anti mage, everyone runs anti mage yeah. for the next month because he has a chance of being so strong. But if your match doesn't go for an hour, you get wrecked because anti mage sucks in Publix. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you are absolutely perfect with your farm. Uh, you just you get wrecked. So, to those listeners out there who have not played Dota, uh, give it a shot. There's no better time to get into Dota. Uh, please play several, many, as many as you can get bot matches before you just jump into people. Because if you jump into a normal match without anything, like I did my first time, you are going to get flamed. Yes, they are brutal. Okay, so that said. I think that's pretty much all we got for us. I think Adam has us a little factoid for the week. I do. I actually have an intro for it as well. Oh, really? Is that some Silent Hill? I think I heard some Silent Hill. It is. Did you know that the school in Silent Hill 1 was based off of the school in Kindergarten Cop? What? Really? Yes. So the yeah the the entrance to the school is the it looks exactly the same as from Kindergarten Cop, and then there are some some areas on the inside that that mimic exact areas from the movie, like the same posters on the wall next to the door, Damn. and and the, the same kind of picture on the bulletin board. Now, is there any fan fiction where those universes are actually the same? I have no idea because I would love to see that. <laughs> it's God. not a tomb. It's little weird alien deformed children. <laughs> it's not a pyramid. That was a terrible Arnold. <laughs> We're going to play a game. Who is Pyramid Head and what does he do? <laughs> Did you just like turn him into a uh, hand banana? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tonight, you. Uh, so, okay. yeah. Well, I think that's all we have for you guys this week. So, until next week, game on. See you, everyone. 
Thanks for listening to the 72 Pin Connector Podcast. We'll have a new one for you every Friday at 10 p.m. EST. Keep up with us on social media for updates and additional content. We have a website, 72pinconnector.com. Our Twitter handle is 72PC Podcast, and our YouTube channel is 72 Pin Connector. Thank you.